my nice new brother WP1 word processor. I could connect the Raspberry Pi up to the UART. Sadly, this turns out not to be viable. This is a very cheap PSOC 5 development board. I need to go and pull up the Cypress development kit and wire that up. Two macro cells and one unique P term, whatever they are. This is recording what all the uh, IO read accesses are. We're going to write this in Verilog and now we head over to the board. Uh, returning 5A, which is the right value. Okay, so here is our Verilog, and here is the value that we're returning. This is a hard-coded value. In fact, 5A is always being asserted to data W. Uh, it's only ever being output to the bus when OE is asserted, which only ever happens when the CPU is reading from our I.O. port. We actually want real data to be read and written. So we need to get some of that from somewhere. And we're going to do it using status and control registers. So we've seen a status register before. This is a readable thing by the CPU. Uh, so we're going to have Four of these, there are going to be four registers in our device that can be written to by the brother word processor. Why four? Because we can do four and we need more than one because for something like a UART that I'm thinking of, we have to have a, uh, a read register, a write register, this is data in and out, and also a register used to tell the brother word processor when data is available and when it's safe to write a byte. So we're going to have to have at least two, and so we might as well go the whole hog with four. So status registers allow the CPU in the PSOC board to read stuff. Display as bus. Uh, control. control registers allow it to write stuff. These can be set by uh, software. Try and get these. Oh, they're not quite the same size, which is why they don't line up properly. The value of these can be set in software from the PSOX processor. Um, and it will then remember that value and continue to assert it to the, the output. So let's just set the names properly. Now it's important to note that input and output can do completely different things. You don't when the when the brother word processor does a read, uh, it doesn't have to read from. It, it'll always read from one of these control registers. This control register does not have to reflect the value of the status register. They are completely independent. So our UART data input and output registers are both going to be on at index zero. So this is the one that's going to be read from by the brother word processor to indicate that it wants to get a byte. This is the one that's going to be written to by the brother word processor to indicate that it wants to send a byte. Now we need to send these into our bus interface. So we need to edit the symbol. So we need to make the box bigger first and let's add digital input. Um, So 
So these are values provided to the bus interface by the PSOC board's CPU. And we want some digital outputs. Oops. Uh, so that output. Ah. Output naught. And uh, last. I need to make the whole box bigger. I mentioned that this is a drawing package. It's not a very good drawing package. Okay, and you can actually move the position of the text independently of the uh, the pins. So let's nope, no one will do that. So let's move these a little bit closer to the output nodes. Okay, so duplicate. Okay. Let's make this the right size. That's just the text. I want I want to edit the box as well. That'll do. Okay. Save. Regenerate the Verilog. Yes, it's safe to overwrite because it will preserve the stuff you edited. You can see it's now added the uh, our additional inputs and outputs. And then over to the schematic. So we now want to wire these up. Like this. You can do all of this stuff from Verilog and you can do all the Verilog stuff using the schematic. I just think that some things are clearer with the schematic and some things are clearer in Verilog. I shall also add that I'm not actually very good at Verilog. So anyone who's actually does it for a living is probably going to watch this and screen that I'm doing it all wrong. Okay, and we also need some clocks. It'd be nice if there was a quick way to get at the standard system clock. Like so. Okay, does it build? It does not because I moved stuff around uh, without changing the wiring. Uh, this is a bit of a problem with the system. It'd be nice if it would rubber band the wiring for you, which it does do sometimes, but it's not consistent. Let me just... Where is that dot appearing? There we go. Okay, so let's build. It'll probably complain there's nothing writing to these. Yep. Okay, so we are now going to use a new Verilog feature. Uh, if I can figure out, no, it's not that one. If I can figure out where it is, we need to tell the uh, we need to tell the system that these parameters are registered. This means that they will remember their value. So uh, we 
write a value to the output and it will keep asserting that value until we write it again. Well, now to do it in code, which is to add reg here. But of course, the next time we uh, update the Verilog, it will lose this. Um, I think we can, yeah, let's just do it like that. It's simplest. I don't think we need to update the Verilog again. Net 2347 is floating, which is 2347. 232, 233, 234. I did set output 2 to be registered. It is no longer floating. It seems to be only 233 and 234. Did I get an error for 235? No. Two three four seven six five four three two one zero. Two three three seven six five two three four two three three. That's weird. Why is it doing that? If all else fails, do a clean and rebuild. It's possible that this change hasn't propagated. No, that's not doing it. There should be a way to set it as registered here, but I don't quite know how to do that. Okay, um, this bit's not interesting, so I will go and figure this out and come back. Okay, I figured it out. It was simply because the reg values were never being assigned to from anywhere. It's another place where the optimizer is making my life painful. Anyway, I did remove the reg keywords from here, and instead I'm defining my own explicit regs and then using assign to assign the output to the regs. This is equivalent but this should be a little bit clearer. So this will not build because of that uh, compilation issue. So we're actually going to have to do a bit more work. So uh, because we have four different address, uh, four different address indices, zero to three for both inputs and outputs, we actually want to I respond to a contiguous range of uh, addresses, which we can do easily enough with uh, for that one one zero zero like this. So decoded is now going to be true for any address from four zero, four one, four two, and four three. And we are also going to add a index, which is simply uh, the bottom two bits of the address line. So we can now use uh, index to decide which of our input and output values we want. We're going to do that here. So when the when the brother is reading, we wish to map one of the input values, which are control registers, to the data bus. 
So we're going to do index equals naught, uh, input naught. Input one, input two, So that should be sufficient for the read side of things. The write side of things is unfortunately a little bit more annoying because we have to interact with the these registered values. And this leads us to the horrible issue of clock synchronization. We can't just assign values to these willy-nilly. We have to do it in sync with the rest of the system. So do that with one of these blocks dot assign always this will let you define a piece of code that effectively gets run every time clock which is our system clock goes positive and this is simple if CPU is writing then uh, I've forgotten my languages. Right, it's like this. If CPU is writing, then we wish to copy the value from the uh, from data R here to one of these output regs. So if index equals zero, then output naught reg is data R. This operator is a assignment operator, whereas the equal sign here is an equivalence operator. This says that this is always going to be this. This says that the value in this gets copied to here whenever the execution of code flows through this point. That's if. I hope I'm getting my syntax right. Ah, okay. Let's see if this builds. And fix the syntax errors. The Verilog syntax is kind of strange and annoying in almost every aspect. Right, now what's it complaining about? Output to reg is not driven by anything. But we are actually initializing it. Um, I think, do we need initial values? Is this going to work? Register, right. Uh, it won't let me do this because we are um, because this is an equivalent. It's saying that output to reg is always zero therefore we cannot copy it here. Uh, do we need a reset pin? I think we might. That would be annoying. 
yeah, let's add a reset pin. So we go back to the, the symbol definition. We move all these down. Data input, we add one here. Reset. This is generally good practice anyway. Ah, we can't do a reset because we've used up all our control registers here. Is there a reset component? No, there is not. Okay, going away to sort this out. Okay, here we go. It's kind of vile, but it does seem to at least build. What we're doing here is saying that uh, every time the every time we get a write operation, or rather every clock cycle where the CPU is writing, then we assign all the register values to either the incoming data or the old value. That way that they all get assigned to every cycle, every clock cycle, and that seems to keep things happy. It does complain about unused pieces of the design. Uh, let me just have a quick look. What, uh, interesting. Control cells two out of four. Have I made a very stupid mistake? Put zero, one, two, and three. Zero, one, two, and three. Index is a four bit value. So this is the report it's generated about what it's done. It's in tech mapping. This is nigh incomprehensible. And uh, yeah, I think something's not right. So let's change that to not three, change that to three. So index should now be zero, one, two, or three. So what could it have? Why is it optimizing stuff out? Unless I made a mistake. It's just still eliminated two of the control cells. See, the other thing we can do is to make the output here registered as well. But I don't think it's necessary. Uh, we would then have a if CPU reading section here that updates it. I think the uh, okay, it has removed control reg two and reg three. So is this actually wired up correctly? That is two three zero. 
This is net 230. Okay, I think it's wired up correctly. So why is... I don't think it likes this for some reason. Okay, let's make that thing registered. If the CPU is reading, then uh, if index is zero, data reg assigned to uh, input zero, else if index is one, data one. Two, three. Let's see what it thinks of that. Does not like it. Okay, we've run out of space. Um, that's because this is too complicated. Maybe it the extra the extra registered value isn't helping. So this has required it to synthesize eight latches to hold the values. Um, now there is a case dex of when I'm going to go look that up. Okay, this is what the syntax for case looks like. Let's see if that actually produces more compact code. Looks like it does not. Okay. Uh, possibly it doesn't like the fact that there are four assignments here. Now, I can't remember whether in Verilog uh, case statements are expressions, but let's try Let's see if it likes this. This way there's one assignment, which should be, no, it doesn't like that. Okay, well, let's try the, try this again. This should do the same thing as my earlier code, but it's laid out differently. Uh, okay. The extra registered value is clearly pushing things above the limit. So we can either drop down to three registers or try and make the original code work. I'm gonna try and make the original code work. Sign data W two So this we do not need this anymore. We don't need this anymore. As I said earlier, this is not a very big FPGA like thing. Whoops. Stop, stop, stop. Don't want do not want to program it or the Brother will crash. Like so. So, are we going to get the same error as before? Unused pieces of the design have been optimized out. Yeah. Now, why is it doing that? He 
seven to zero, seven to zero, seven to zero, seven to zero. Um, I can force it not to optimize those out by setting values, which we're going to want to do anyway. So what's this going to do? Huh. Of course, they've been optimized out, so these don't exist anymore. I think I figured it out. And this is going to be one of those bits where the Verilog people out there are going to be screaming at me. This is a two-bit value. This is a one-bit value. So index can only have value 0 or 1, which means that index equals 2 is never going to be true. So let's set that to that and then build it. And we are out of space. Fantastic. We've run out of P terms. Whatever a P term is. Okay, can we strip this down any? I bet there is a standard idiom for doing this, which I am going to go and find out. Okay, well, I couldn't get I couldn't make it fit at all, so I just decided to go down to two registers each. Uh, it does simplify the code quite a lot, and it puts us comfortably under the p-term limit. It went from 98 down to 50, so the extra two registers was clearly using almost exactly half of the p-term use, so whatever a p-term is. Anyway, there's actually a better way to do this, which is to use uh, one of data path, come on, where is it? Uh, which is to use a data path component, which I do not actually seem to find offhand. It's somewhere around. Uh, the, the data path tool is basically a miniature CPU and you use you can use this tool to configure it. It'll also show up as a component with lots of stuff on it. Is it under logic? I've used it in the past. It's got to be here somewhere. Uh, it's got a whole ton of functionality, including FIFOs, the ability to do computations, uh, all that sort of stuff, and it would make doing this fairly straightforward, except it's a complete pain in the ass to use, particularly if you want to do parallel data input and output, which I am doing here. I had to do that for the Flux Engine port, and that was grim. I spent so much time trying to fix it, and then eventually someone else fixed it for me. Uh, this uh, the, this chip has four of them, so if I could figure out where they were, that would help. Anyway, this now builds. Uh, it's producing a warning here. Setup time violation. Now, this is because... It's taking too long for uh, a change to propagate through the schematic. Uh, as a result, uh, by the time the change propagates all the way through the logic, it then something else might have changed. And 
there's a timing analysis here and here you can see that it's saying that uh, the current logic the maximum frequency supported is 17 megahertz but I've asked for 29 now why is where is that happening here um, this is from the control register to one of these nets to okay that's 232 so I bet 232 is one of these yeah uh, it's the I bet it's taking too much time going through here uh, there are a number of ways around that but the simplest is to simply reduce the speed of the machine come on standard if we go down to 14.5 megahertz then this is the um this is the clock used by the UART, which should be in range. Can you set these to anything other than integers? I bet you can't. What does 13 do? That puts it more out of range. How about 15? That's closer. Okay, back to the schematic. Let's take a look at the UART, which is over here. 115.2 that is actually out of range uh, it said that 17 was that's even more out of range yeah it said that uh, 17 was the maximum frequency now there are ways around this I wonder could we simplify this code I think we probably can let's stick this back to 29 and let's take a look at that Verilog again now the reason for this chunk is so that if you look at the schematic actually the outputs here remember their values and continue to assert them so that the status registers here always uh, read the last value output this will make the software side of things easier however we can probably do this all in software we just need to be able to read the value out of the register quickly enough um, so what we would do is whenever the the brother tries to write to one of the output ports we would raise an interrupt then the CPU would have to service the interrupt quickly enough to read the value from the status register uh, so the status register would now be wired directly to the the data bus it would have to read the value quickly enough to capture the value before the end of the bus transaction is that plausible I wonder it's a rather small number of cycles let's take another look at this so excuse me one second a small insect small cr uh, walking across my keyboard apparently my computer's got bugs in it yes um now there is this wait cycle thing 
uh, during the read cycle, well, during the read or write cycle, the external hardware is allowed to assert weight and halt the CPU until something happens. But I don't know how long it's allowed to wait for. So I'd have to go and look into that. Because I bet that trying to wait indefinitely would cause the uh, the machine to crash as the DRAM stops being refreshed and all the data expires. Yeah, let's not go there. Here we go, introducers, wait cycles. If low at the falling edge, T2. Yeah, we could probably insert some, but I don't really fancy that idea. The other thing is we can change the clock speed of the UART to be more friendly to a lower clock speed. So let's try that with 14. This is is out of range. That is still out of range. Still out of range. That's in range. I don't think I want to run this thing in 19.2 kiloboard. That is quite slow. You know, it's a Z80, that's fine. That's probably going to be... Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that the clock generation isn't a bit cleverer than that. We can tell it to pull the clock from somewhere else. At least I think we can. So we could generate our own clock. Let's just leave it like that. That is, that is simple. So now if we build it, hopefully we should not get the timing error. The other advantage of doing this is it doesn't actually matter. Excellent, it's clean. This one warning is these, which I'm no longer using. So reg zero contains hex one, two, reg one contains hex one, three. So let's program that and head on over to the workbench. Okay, so the machine has not crashed while we've been fiddling with it, so let's run the program and this should produce one, two. One, two it is. Okay, let's change this to print get four, one. Okay, and run it and this should get three, four, I think it was. Uh, that's not right. One nine. No, that should be one three from looking at the other monitor. One eight is wrong too, actually. Intriguing. Most intriguing. Um, 
Well, I figured out what the problem was after about 45 minutes of debugging and rewriting everything several times, and it's pretty straightforward. If I run this, we get 1.8 and 1.9, which are the wrong values. But what happens if I look at what the hex of 1.8 is and the hex of 1.9? Yes, they are in fact the right values. I was just printing them in the wrong base. So this should be hex of 40 and, whoops, hex of 41. And one eight and one, one two and one, th yes, one two and one three are the right values, right. It is currently 10 past midnight, and as you can tell, I'm getting a bit tired. But anyway, we now have nearly all, I think all of the Verilog stuff working. So I'm going to take a break here, and then next time, I'm going to work on the actual software side of things. So that'll be nice.